Thank, we, we have to be thankful to Charlotte. She is so good uh, and uh, she has reminded us of a few things about John Wesley. I told you a story of what happened to me at Hartfield Elementary. That uh, one uh, evening I was there, we had let them use our shares and they wanted to check to thank our church for the use of the chairs. And I, they knew I was there, so they called me and, and they said, is Mr. John Wesley here? <laughs> <laughs> and again, uh, I thought for myself, I wish. Uh, <laughs> uh, who was John Wesley and what is Aldous Gate Sunday? What is it that we're celebrating today? Aldous Gate actually happened yesterday, uh, always commemorated yesterday. It was May 24th, 1738, when uh, John Wesley, after a long journey, spiritual journey, and also physical journey, he had just returned from Georgia back to England a few months before that, at the end of uh, 1737, in disaster, in failure, and uh, he said, I better seek God. And he had his experience of the warm heart. That day, John Wesley attended a service in the street called Aldersgate in London. And that's where the name Aldersgate comes from. Aldersgate, the name of the street, where this worship service with the Moravian Church uh, he was there with Moravian Christians. If some of you sometimes go to another church uh, in search of something, that's fine. John Wesley did that too. <laughs> John Wesley was an Anglican, but he was hanging out with Moravian Christians, trying to learn from them. Of course, he returned back to the Anglican church, and then he was expelled, so he founded his own church, the Methodist Church. But that day he wrote on his uh, journey after uh, the service when he went back to his room, he wrote, I felt my heart strangely, strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone. Remember him in Christ alone? So I trust in Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine and saved me from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. What was it that happened that day as a result of what journey in his life? Well, his conversion of, or revival experience, whatever you want to call it, happened at two levels, two different levels. Naturally, it happened at the levels of the emotions, at the levels of his spiritual life, since he said that he felt something in his heart, in his spirit, that it was warm. Now, in addition to that, the events of that day were a result of an evolution of his understanding his, of, of the Bible and of the way of salvation. He had been studying for a long time with, with the Moravian Christians, learning how salvation operates, how is it that we are saved. When he came to Georgia, when he came to the 13 colonies, he thought, wrongly so, that he could do something for his salvation. So he wrote in his journal before coming to the US, or to the 13 colonies at the time, he wrote, I'm going to preach to the Indians, to see if I can do something to save my soul. You see how wrong that is? Now on his way here, he met the Moravians, and on the way back, you know, the experience of the sinking ship, and how he was trembling for his life, and he saw the Moravian Christians sinking in the middle of the storm. And he said, I want to have that. That, that how he began learning and studying with them, and he learned that salvation doesn't come as something you earn by doing is rather something uh, you accept for free. It is, a, it is by the grace of God as a gift. When we repent of our sins and confess our sins and we are saved. So two things happened in the life of Wesley and we cannot isolate one from the other. 
first was study of the scriptures. You see, it was an intellectual journey. He was learning with the Moravians and studying the scriptures. He was, that day, the day of August Gate, he was listening to the reading of Martin Luther's commentary on the book of Romans, the letter to the Romans. If you want to find something more boring than that. And he was a very intellectual man. He was a graduate from Oxford University in England, and he liked to study. So he was studying deeply to the scriptures, whatever, however, study by itself cannot save us if we don't pray, if we are not in communion with God, and what happened in Aldous Gate was a result of both his mind being developed at, at the same time as his heart was being developed by praying, by seeking God, by attending worship and the sacraments. And the third thing, by having an outstretched arm and hands to give and to serve others. So those three things combined in the United Methodist Church, uh, study of scriptures, and uh, we see him there with the book, the Bible. He said, I am the man, a man of one book. However, he had a long list of other books that preachers should read, and he made sure that uh, pastors, his pastors, would always be reading. And he was, in that horse, there was some, I guess you can call them bags. Saddlebags. Saddlebags, full of books. And he would be visiting his pastor and saying, now it's your turn to read this one, and you do this one. So he was a, uh, an itinerant library moving around and around. So now we say that we Methodists, we are open heart, open mind, and open doors. That is what characterizes uh, the United Methodist Church. We are a church of dialogue. John Wesley had his entire life to witness dialogue between his own father and his own mother. His father, Sam, Reverend Samuel Wesley, was a pastor in the Anglican Church, very traditional. His mother was an immigrant from Germany, very much influenced by the Moravians and by the Puritan movement. This was uh, a movement that happened outside of the regular institutional church because they wanted to go further, deeper into Reformation than Martin Luther himself wanted to go. So they formed their independent movement and they went to England when things got a little scary for them in continental Europe. So he saw John Wesley grew up seeing his father and his mother with two different styles, but they were a couple. They talked to each other, they didn't divorce. Is it uncommon for husband and wife to have different ideas? That's not uncommon. Actually, you each has a, have a brain, and you're supposed to use it. If you use it, you will see that there will be differences of opinions and differences of ideas, but they can coexist and live together in dialogue. That is the formation that John Wesley had from his birth, uh, and uh, he grew up to be um, a man of a Catholic spirit. That means a universal spirit. We will talk more about that in a minute. But first, let's go to the scripture that we've read today and see that Paul, the apostle, had the same idea too. Integration of mind and heart. So Paul writes to the Ephesians in the middle of a controversy because they were uh, suffering those who were coming to them, the Ephesians, and telling them, hey, if you become a Christian, you have to also circumcise, become like a Jew. And Paul had that problem everywhere he went, uh, differences of, of opinion within the church. These were Gentile Christians having an argument or discussion with Jewish Christians. So within the church, and Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, and he says, as a prisoner of the Lord. Now think about the passion 
and the self-giving of Paul to the cause of the gospel when he is in prison because of his beliefs. Why do I say that? Because we think that for there to be dialogue, there has to be uh, an abandonment of our true beliefs. And that's not the case. For there to be dialogue, I first have to be true to my own beliefs and my own convictions. So Paul was a man that had become uh, a full-hearted Christian, uh, Christian, and he was ready to die for his convictions. However, even though he was a prisoner, see the next line. As a prisoner for the Lord, somebody who's ready to die or be in prison, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Uh oh, so we have a, you see the evolution in Paul? Before, when he was a Pharisee, he was ready to persecute and to imprison and even to agree to the murdering of those who had a different opinion than his. He was on the other camp. He was on the camp of the Judaizers. He was on the camp of the uh, strict Jewish Pharisees. And now he has made an evolution. And he says, even though I am true to my principles and I am ready to preach what I believe, however, we have to do so in a spirit of humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love. I guess that's not important today because I guess we are all of the same mind, right? <laughs> well, in reality, when we look around, the world today is becoming more and more and more polarized. Last Saturday, uh, a week ago, we had a visit of Dr. Barry Berner talking about um, relationship between astronomy and the Bible and theology. He spoke even more broadly the relationship between science and faith. And there was a question that was asked of him. Are there any, any more scientists today who are atheists? Because it's certainly seen that way, that most scientists today are atheists. And he said, well, no, I don't think that. I, I don't think so. I, I think that we've always had scientists who are atheists and all the scientists who are Christians or uh, believers in any religion. What is happening today, whatever, is that we have more polarization in which people are becoming more vocal and more vocal and more extremist. So those who are atheists, they want everybody else to be like them. And those who have Christian beliefs, they are also becoming more vocal and extremist and fundamentalist. And they want to expel the discussion of science from the classrooms and from the public dialogue. So we are living in a world of polarization and extremism, he said. And I was very pleased to hear that because, I mean, not about the fact that that is happening, but I think that he is putting his finger on uh, the wound or hitting the nail in the head, if I'm learning some English idioms. <laughs> um, the same is happening all around, where you, wherever you look. If you look at our uh, political arena, how much dialogue is there happening between uh, Republicans and Democrats? Not much. We live in a polarized world. Uh, how much dialogue is, is happening uh, within religions? We are under the danger because there's one group in, within the Islam that has become so radicalized and extremist, uh, and they are ready to kill on the false name of religion, we, they themselves, the Islam, they are under the danger of being, being um, uh, stereotyped. Uh, and then we are under the risk that considering that that's what Islam is about, which is not the case. Uh, 
So there are many Muslims who are working for peace, and uh, we are ready, and we should learn from them, actually, and engage in a dialogue. As we speak, I'm so glad that Pope Francisco, as his name is Spanish, he's from Argentina. There had to be somebody from Latin America to go to the Vatican and bring some sense into this world. And he, I think, is in Bethlehem as we speak, not by himself. He asked a Jewish rabbi and he asked a uh, Muslim Iman, is that how we pronounce it, or Iman Iman, to be with him because even though he is in Bethlehem, he doesn't want to be his trip about Christianity being the only religion in the world, his league seeking dialogue and understanding. Uh, so that is the world that we have today, and in which we, we, that the world that we should work for today. Um, I'm glad I came to the U.S. We're not so too bad. When I look about the world of sports in all the places, where fans of different clubs fight each other, literally, and I think we have some Gators fan here and some Seminole fans here in the church. And I always talk about that as an example of how we can and we should live together in unity. Now, John Wesley spoke about this, about being true to your own beliefs and uh, being sure of who you are and what you have learned at the same time as you're willing to engage in dialogue with others. He, the best friend, one of his best friends, George Whitefield, was actually completely outside of the mental church as far as his theology. George Whitefield believed in predestination. However, he was always a Methodist, and John Wesley never expelled him from the mental church. Uh, now, let's take a look at this sermon, The Catholic Spirit, that John Wesley wrote, um, and uh, see if we can learn a few things about it. Um, John Wesley is talking about um, the universal spirit, the openness that we must have to dialogue. And he's quoting uh, from the New Testament, uh, the commandment that we have from Jesus and uh, that we also have in the first letter uh, from John, to love one another because God is love. So if you have hatred in your heart, get rid of it because it does not come from God. Love comes from God. So John Wesley is talking about this text, and let me give you, uh, uh, before we read it, a hint. Uh, John Wesley is also uh, interpreting this, that the, the text that he actually used as the foundation for this sermon comes from the second book of Kings, chapter uh, 10, verse 15. Uh, and uh, the verse will be quoted there, so, so you will read it. But in that, in that verse, you have a king, Jehu, who was fighting for God against Baal, uh, the false gods. And then he meets another person uh, within Israel, and his name would be there, I have difficulties pronouncing it. Uh, but they had totally different mindsets. However, they were both believers in God. And Jehu comes to this person and asks him, is your heart right with me as my heart is right with yours? He replied, yes. And then King Jehu said, well, if it is, then give me your hand. Let's shake hands and let's be one. So this is what you they said interpreting this text. And again, beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. He that does not love, does not know God, for God is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us, and He sent His Son to be the propitiation, the self-gift for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. All men approve of this. But do all men and women practice that? That experience shows the contrary. Where we even, the Christians who love one another, as he has given us 
commandment? Do we Christians, do we love, our, do we have that love within one another? How many hindrances lie in the way of this love? The two grand general hindrances are first, that they cannot all think alike, and in consequence of this, secondly, they cannot all walk alike. However, in several smaller points, their, their practice must be fair, as their opinions differ. But, even though a difference in opinions or modes of worship may prevent an entire external union, yet, may it prevent our union in affection? Though we cannot think alike, may we not love alike? May we not be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion? Without a doubt, we may. And thus, all the children of God may unite, even though they retain these smaller differences. Thus, remaining as they are, they may help one another increase in love and in good works. Uh, surely, in this respect, you're going to have time to go to lunch today, okay? I promise. Before 2 p.m. and 3 p.m., we will finish. <laughs> Surely, in this respect, the example of Jehu himself, as a mixed character as he was, very controversial king, is well worthy both of the attention and the imitation of every serious Christian. And when he left there, Jehu met Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him, and he greeted him and said to him, Is your heart right as my heart is with your heart? And Jehonadab answered, It is. So Jehu said, If it is, give me your hand. I would like for this to be read in Congress. I would like for this to be read in our own legislature. I would like for this to be read in our church. I would like for this to be read in our general conference and annual conference. We can think alike. I, excuse me, we don't have to think alike. But can we not love alike? For sure, we can. So Paul, in the next slide, is uh, his writing and he's saying there are many differences that we have, many differences of opinion. However, in Christ, there is only one body, one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, I have to say, Christians are not, are not Christians. Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ purchased us. So he's acknowledging we each have our own grace, our own gift, and even our, our own ideas. However, we have to be together and love one another and live in unity. Um, that is the church that you have come to. That is our mark, one of our marks. Open hearts, open minds, open doors, which we welcome everybody, and I would add to open hands, open arms, outreach to embrace people and to give and to help others regardless of who they are. In the conclusion of his sermon, um, The Catholic Spirit, John Wesley abounds about it, and, and he says, uh, But, while he is steadily fixed in his religious principles, that means, be sure about what you believe. Don't change your mind. Be convinced of that which God called you to believe. Um, be steady in your religious principles, in what you believe to be the truth as it is in Jesus. While he firmly adheres a person to, these, uh, to that worship of God, a person with the Catholic or the universal spirit, while he or she firmly adheres to, what, to that worship of God which he or she judges to be most acceptable in his sight, 
and while he or she is united by the tenderest and the closest ties to one particular congregation, his heart is enlarged towards all mankind, John Wesley writes. Those he knows and those he does not. Loving those you know and even those who do, you do not, he or she who has the Catholic spirit embraces with strong and cordial affection both neighbors and strangers, friends and enemies. This is the Catholic or universal love. And he or she that has this, uh, that has this is of a Catholic spirit, he or she is of this Catholic spirit, for love alone gives the title to this character. Catholic love is a Catholic spirit. As we today rejoice in our tradition, in our legacy as Methodists, enjoy one another and embrace this spirit. You have come to the right church if you are unhappy with polarized politics or polarized uh, scientific opinions or polarized baseball or sport allegiances. If you are a uniter, you have come to the right church. Today we ask you to uh, commit yourself to your faith. Do not give it up. We have to be full-hearted, committed Christians. At the same time, we have to be open to dialogue with others. With open hearts, open minds, open doors, and open, open hands. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for the founder of our church. We thank you for Aldersgate, a heart that is burning in love and faith, and a mind that is open to dialogue, to conversation with others. Help us to keep that legacy alive amongst us. In your name we pray. Amen.